Uh, I want to first of all thank you for coming. Hopefully what you're going to get out of today is just some information that's going to help you as you go forward to make some informed decisions on your investments for cashless. We really want this to be a dialogue. We're, we have very little prepared. We're expecting that you have questions, that's why you're here. And we have, uh, we believe, a good group of people to help answer those questions. So uh, please, if you don't have any questions thought of, uh, now's the time. So uh, I've got some ideas on how to get started, but I'll kick you through some slides to get to begin the, pro uh, the, the meeting. I think one of the things I wanted to share early on is I think you're going to need to think differently about technology investments going forward. Things like EMV are going to change the uh, time frame on investments. You know, we know that the, the vending machines you purchase, you expect to have for 15, 20 years, or, or even longer in some cases. But when it comes to cashless investment, you're going to have to think differently. Uh, the technology is going to change more rapidly, driven by security standards around the world. So the days of a, of a, a payment system lasting, say, 15 years in the cashless space, I think are going to going to quickly go away. And we don't know what that time frame is going to be, but I just want to plant that seed as you think about your investment strategy going forward. Um, when, when we open up for Q&A, uh, a gentleman in the back of the room, Mike, has a microphone, and we're videotaping this session. So if you could just give, raise your hand, give him a second to run over and let you uh, talk into the microphone. That'll make it easier for everybody to hear your question and for us to capture it on videotape as well. Okay, so appreciate that. Um, let me start by introducing the panel that we have with us today. I'll go from left to right. First of all, we have Brad Tedder, who is a vice president and general manager for our intelligent vending business within CPI. We have Doug Haddon, who is the global director for intelligent vending. We have Patrick Richards, who is our product man cashless product manager. And Brendan Kehoe on the end is the vice president and general manager for Streamware. So these panelists were chosen as uh, folks that are in the business, understand cashless, and are, to one degree or another, already implementing EMV in some global markets and certainly have a good perspective on, on those global markets. What I've got prepared is just a couple quick slides, just level set everybody in terms of what EMV is all about. And with that, then I'm going to hopefully open up for, for questions, all right? So EMV, well, let me first start with an agenda. So what we hope to do is cover these topics with you today. What's EMV? What are the benefits of the adoption for our industry? Um, when is EMV expected to transition the U.S.? And where is it already being deployed from a vending perspective? What are the, what's a liability shift? As you read anything on EMV, the one thing you'll read about is liability shift. What is that? And what does it mean? What does it mean to you as a vending operator? What facts do I need to consider as I make my cashless investment decisions going forward? And I think that's a key element of what you, we hope you get out of today, is giving you the information that you can then decide for your own business and for your own customer base, based upon their security needs, what you want to do going forward. And then who's providing the EMV solutions today? Who, who can you look to as either a thought leader or someone that can give you some good insight as they've deployed EMV around the world? It's, EMV is a very different animal than what you're used to in terms of typical cashless in the U.S. today. Okay? EMV, what is it? EMV stands for EuroPay MasterCard Visa. It was a standard developed back in 1994 of all, of all time periods. So it's not a new standard. It's been around a long time. And it's been implemented around the world, uh, and you'll see that on a map in a little bit. Basically, it is a standard to allow microchip embedded cards to talk to POS terminals. So it's a combination of the microchip card and the terminal that's being presented that card, and how do those two interface with one another and then pass that information down through the cashless uh, uh, process and gateway. Chip embedded cards are nearly impossible to duplicate. And what you'll hear as you read about it is that every time you present a card for a transaction, the card data changes. So instead of a static magnetic stripe where as soon as you're able to capture that, it's forever, uh, every time an EMV card is presented, the data changes. And that's what the benefit of the chip is. So you can't duplicate something that's never used twice. And that's a real benefit of the EMV chip card. Um, there are additional layers of security, and this panel is much smarter than I am with regard to what those uh, really mean. But encryption, tokenization, and other authentication techniques really make EMV uh, much more difficult to fraud, if not impossible to fraud. It's also important to point out that the United States is the only country in the G20 that has not implemented EMV. In fact, we're the only country in the world that hasn't implemented EMV, and you saw that on a map in a little bit. 
what is the EMV process? How does it work? And I, I just threw this up, not to, to, to spend a lot of time on, but EMV is very similar to what you're used to if you're already using cashless. There's a cashless reader in the vending space. There's a telemeter attached to that to send out the cashless uh, information. And then there's an acquirer, somebody that captures that encrypted data, sends it on to a bank processor and back through. There's two key elements that are different with EMV. One, at the front end where the card is presented, there's an additional layer of security. Before, in a MagStripe world, when you swipe your card, the data is encrypted and sent through. In an EMV world, there's an additional layer of security where you might have to provide either a PIN information or some other additional information in some applications where the card itself is yet still not enough for you to uh, be able to process the transaction. In addition, there's this term authorized, uh, authorization request cryptogram. ARQC, and that is the uh, terminology that basically says that card data is going out with each time with a different packet of information attached to it, such that it's always changing. And that's a different, uh, although the MagStripe data is encrypted today, it's not always changing as it is in the EMV world. Why do you care about EMV? Why, why are you even here? Why should you bother to worry about it? Well, first of all, EMV provides stronger fraud protection. I think what we all witnessed last November with the Target breach uh, was a real wake-up call for everybody in terms of, Jesus, security stuff really is real. and impacted, we think, as many as 110 million Americans. That's a lot of people uh, that have been impacted. And, you know, Target did what they could do, but their sales have been down 46% since the, uh, the breach. It's a sign that people then vote with their wallets in terms of their comfort level with your security. So just because you may think you're fine doesn't mean your customer base may down the road. So I think you need to think about EMV from that perspective. It's a de facto global standard. I'll show you the map in just a moment. We're the only country in the world that has yet to adopt EMV. It's a proven solution. It started in 1994. So this is not something that just started recently and you have to worry about whether the technology is proven or not. 1994 is uh, a long time ago. The, the big issue, and I put it in red, is the pending liability shift. Now, let me just read to you what the pending liability shift is. So beginning in October of 2015, the merchant, which in this audience would be the, the, the uh, vendor operator, and is, is, is responsible for fraud, not the merchant bank or the issuing bank. So any kind of counterfeit fraud that is presented at your vending machine where there's an EMV card presented, and you're not EMV capable, and therefore you're taking a fraudulent card, is uh, then that liability shifts to you. This is not a mandate. This is an incentive. And I think it's important to point out just that, that there's nothing being mandated here or directed. Um, the approach is to incentivize merchants to make the switch to EMV for everybody's benefit, to really provide a whole level, level, another level of security in terms of uh, uh, the merchant and then the, uh, the Ben patron. Okay. So EMV, this is a, just a map of the world, and everything you see colored other than in gray uh, is a country that's already adopted EMV, and if you look, the only country that isn't is U.S. So from a fraud perspective, as we go forward, what you're gonna find is that uh, these other countries become less uh, easy for the fraud uh, elements to do something with. They're gonna all point towards the U.S., and that's one of the reasons why e adopting EMV is an important uh, step, next step for us as a country, otherwise, we're going to be the only country in the world where that fraud is going to be able to take place. This slide just, the intent of this slide is just to basically show that even the folks in the industry don't expect by uh, 2015 that 100 percent of the POS terminals around the world are going to be EMV capable. You know, the, the, on this chart it shows 57 percent, and I'm sure there's other charts with different numbers, but the point is that, again, it's not a mandated change. And we're not, no one's expecting that every POS terminal in the U.S. is going to be switched over to EMV capability by 2015. But it is a sign that it's, there's a lot of progress being made, as you can see by the chart. And by the end of 2017, there is an expectation that fully uh, more than two-thirds of the terminals around the United States will be EMV capable. Okay? And I just throw this agenda back up to uh, kind of remind you what we're trying to cover. And that's all I had for prepared slides. So. Uh, well, we want to open up for questions. Does anybody have anything to get started, or don't mean to throw a couple softballs out to get the ball rolling? Go ahead. The liability comes to, to us as the retailer, but what are we liable for? If someone is fishing and, and puts a, um, what's it called, a reader? 
where they can grab the numbers. Are we liable for that? Are we liable for someone buying a dollar's worth of candy? And are we liable for the dollar? Good question. I can answer that one. There you go. Uh, you, I would say uh, right now you're already liable for the skimmer. Okay. So uh, under today's rules, you know you're 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 li you're you're liable for the physical physical security of your reader. Uh, so if someone attaches a skimming device and is able to steal, then and that's uh, pointed back to you when they figure out where the where the uh, the card numbers were stolen. You're already liable for that. Okay. What this liability shift is about is if somebody uses a uh, um, a fraudulent card to purchase that dollar, you're fraud you're on the hook for the dollar. If the bank comes after you. So to add to that, um, you know, so that's a pretty small risk, and a stat that actually I learned yesterday that I, I didn't understand in terms of I, I knew it was small, but how small it is. In the past year, within a customer base, in the past year across about 50,000 machines, total liability of fraudulent cards that were presented and accepted was in the neighborhood of $1,100. So at you know, 100 cases a year, $1.25 each kind of throughput, tremendously small percentage on that. So um, you, know, you, you have to ask yourself if your target, it's a, uh, it's a lot different with a fraudulent card and you're selling TVs, you know, we're selling small ticket items. Someday someone will want to go and empty out of any machine somewhere potentially with that. But I mean, what, you know, if you think about it from that rational perspective, that risk and the real, the real liability is, is relatively small. Um, you know, never say never, right? But that's, that's that is how that liability shift works and that is what the risk is. So how do you, how do you, what do you look for if I'm if I'm a vending operator? What's the trigger point that's going to say to me, okay, now's the time I really need to think about making that next investment and, and moving towards EMV? What what would you be looking for to know it's time? Well, I mean, I think it's a little bit of you know chicken and the egg, right? So you know the announcements that came out from the card schemes you know two years ago. Um, announcing that there was going to be a move to, to chip technology uh, in the U.S., the first thing people thought of, well, well you know, thought of was you have to wait until consumers start to have cards, right? So it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg. There's, well, you, know, you probably don't want to go out and replace terminals if nobody is carrying said card. It's kind of the same thing we see with some of the mobile technology. So you know, there's a lot of hype about uh, you know, accepting certain types of mobile payments, but until you've got some, you know, until you've got a large number of customers using that technology, you know, you kind of just want to monitor those trends. Um, I think one thing that we've seen so far, Chuck, this year is that the issuers have gotten fairly aggressive in the U.S. with issuing chip cards. Um, I would say everybody on this panel, I think, has a chip card in their wallet right now. Um, and probably a number of you in the audience have a chip card in your wallet today. So um, I think that right there is an indication that it's probably start, you know, it's probably time to start looking at it. Um, I wouldn't say go, you know, we're not saying go out and you know replace all of your terminals, but I think just forward looking, you should probably you know I think the chart that you showed you know around the 2015 timeline, um, there's going to be about 50% of the terminals in the market. Um, I, I think it really you have to look at um, you know what makes sense for your business as far as you know when you are going to be deploying cashless and when you might need to be replacing terminals that are uh, somewhat aged in your field base. But I think that's the key thing: is this a business decision? Um, you know, part of and and given that you know, MEI, CPI is in, the, is in the payment enablement business, and a lot of what we push is accepting what's in the consumer's pocket. Um, the consumer's pocket is going to change related to the technology they have in their pocket. And at some point in time, you will, hit, you will you'll cross that threshold mm -hmm. around the chicken and the egg. Particularly, in fact, David and I were talking about it yesterday, um, that particularly in, in border locations, you know, because we're surrounded by, or, or you know, international locations where we have a high, have high percentage of people coming in, there, you know, I experience the opposite of it now, going to Europe, traveling around, meeting with customers there, it's very hard to get someone to accept a card with MagStripe on it. It's all, you know, when you, when you have a chip, you need a chip-based card to be able to make the, the majority of transactions there. We're years away from that time frame, but you know, making an educated choice about your business, investing in that technology as you go at the right time based off of where it is for you, making that choice, it costs more money to, to read, to buy a reader that accepts more media on it, you know, that if you want to add on just more than MagStripe, contactless and contact-based. We have that breadth of portfolio, you know, and you've got to kind of measure that risk reward. When's the right time for you to invest? And what's the right mix of technology that you want to have? But, you know, the time frame where it becomes important for that mix is measured in years, not in months. So 
um, is making that informed decision and, and uh, you know, and deciding what's right for you as a business owner to, uh, to then go and make that investment. I wonder, do you know, if, would your accounts be asking about that going forward? Will you, as a vending operator, do you, do you, would your accounts come to you and say, hey, are these readers EMV compliant? I've been reading a lot about it. I happen to be one of the victims in the target breach and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Is that something that would be a trigger point as well? If they ask for EMV yeah. capable terms. Yeah, what's, what's, where do you go back? Okay. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, you can't go back with, <clears throat> you know, an EMV compliant reader in, in the United States today, but you do have choices to say, I have a device that I can put in there that when the time comes, that I can update it over the air or provide that capability in the future. And that's really one of the things that we're talking about from a product perspective. Um, we see a product suite that, you know, when you're starting to make those decisions, right, that are forward capable when the time comes. Well, Doug, talk about, I think that that question leads to, the, let's talk about the EMV in terms of an ecosystem. It isn't just the hardware, right? That's one of the reasons you're making the comment. You, right. We could produce, we produce today, we EMV compliant hardware we sell in Europe. Why can't I just get that in the U.S. and problem solved? Let's talk a little bit about that ecosystem well, because it it's isn't the just the whole that ecosystem easy. that needs to be compliant. Um, I think it was, I mean, and I think there's a difference between yeah. compliant and capable, right. right? So, I mean, you can buy a compliant card reader, but if it's not capable of processing that chip transaction, then you've just got a compliant device. So, I mean, the, the, the proof is in the pudding is when you, you know, go to insert your card into that chip reader, you need to be able to process a chip transaction. I mean, that's the, the capability needs to be there, not just from the card reader side, but from the telemeter and the payment, you know, software that's running on it through your, you know, gateway and whoever your processing partner is upstream. So everybody in that chain has to be able to process that transaction. It's not just about it's not simply just buying the card reader. So you really have to kind of look at your solutions providers today and understand when they'll be able to provide the full, you know, chip capable or EMV solution. Okay. Is, is it gonna cost me more, uh, either for the hardware or for the transactions when I get to an EMV compliant world? Do we know? Um, I'm not sure if we know the answer to that. I mean, I don't think it's gonna cost any more from a transaction perspective, um, you know, from a processing perspective, but, you know, from a hardware perspective, the, the chip reader itself is, it's an incremental piece of hardware. So whether it's a separate device that you fit onto a machine or it's, you know, bundled into um, a current product along with a MagStripe reader, I mean, there's physically more components in the device. So I would say, you know, there's potential that there could be some incremental cost to that. Um, because well, that, it's, it's, it's more than just, you know, your you know, standard black box device that's just reading a mag drive. There's, there's more software, there's more technology um, in well, the actual front device. And there's more compliance. So part of this regulation is about the, you know, you can imagine to make sure all the handshakes work correctly with the, you know, ever-changing encryption that Chuck described earlier. There's also, there's a high compliance overhead. Um, there are multiple levels. There's, in fact, three levels of certification that you go through, and there's a requirement that you must recertify any time you change the reader or, any, or, or every three years, whichever comes first. And the compliance dollars are real dollars measured in hundreds of thousands of dollars kind of investment as a, as a hardware company. So it's not, you know, there's incremental cost that is involved from a reading technology perspective. There is a real compliance cost as, as a hardware manufacturer. It doesn't add, it's not gonna double the cost of a card reader kind of deal. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a sub percentage of that. But um, that is, you know, as you'd expect, you read more media, you have more bits and bytes in there that are enabling that, That's, there's more cost. And so therefore the, the price will be higher associated with it. And those compliance costs, are, you know, as that Brad mentioned, that's that's a cost that's, that's bared by the hardware provider and the solution provider. So, you know, as an operator, you're not responsible to go through any level of, you know, certifications on your own. You don't have to be the one to put out the money for those. Um, that's handled by, by the folks that are selling you the solutions. Which is nice. I mean, we're accountable for that. And uh, that's part of being compliant. That's what, those are the hoops we've jumped through to make sure that we're delivering that device that meets all those standards and helps to protect you and that consumer. Is the, is the fraud reduction that they've seen in Europe significant? And would the card companies have any incentive to try to help you buy hardware? Yeah, for example, I just I pulled up this slide. Uh, in the UK, uh, 
uh, is the third bullet point. So card purchase volume in the UK grew 32% between 05 and 2010, and total card fraud decreased over that same period with all that increase by 17%. And the first point, um, in 2008, total fraud losses to all parties on signature-based transactions were 13 basis points. For pin-based transactions, they were just three and a half basis points. So yeah, there's significant f uh, reduction in fraud when EMV is implemented, wherever it's been implemented. Significant. But, you know, but even in the UK, even though fraud actually, when they implemented EMV, actually went up in the card not present, let's say from an internet perspective, because criminals, you know, they're pretty resourceful, <laughs> right? And they try to go, you know, the path of least resistance. So they saw actually fraud go up in card not present, let's say from internet sales, and then, uh, then they started, you know, putting in processes in order to eliminate that. And then, and then you saw those type of um, reductions overall. It, but there's that kind of, there's that risk reward element as well as that kind of, from a criminal's perspective, return on investment aspect. You know, so from, from the stat I shared earlier, the risk to us as a bidding operator is already really low. But those stats there, so yes, ultimately there's a reduction, but that's across all of the transactions that are there, where it's worth a criminal to go and buy something of high value with a fraudulent card. Um, that is what it's designed to solve, and it does a really good job of doing that. Uh, when do you foresee the um, EMV uh, ecosystem being developed? You're talking about all the, all the things have to be in place, correct? When do you foresee that being? Is that a year away, two years away? I, I know it. There's a lot of things that are involved with that, a lot of different entities, but do you have a projection on that? Well, it's been, <laughs> on, it's been ongoing, yeah. right? I mean, you think about it, they've got to issue cards, right? But there, there's a lot of costs associated with that. You know, to manufacture, let's say, a MagStripe card is about 15 cents. You know, a chip-based card is 2 to $4. There's like over a billion cards out in the U.S. market today, so you just think about that cost in order to replace those cards. So there's, there's gradual things going on right now to, you know, to ramp up to replace that overall infrastructure. You'll see, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, people, it's a target, I believe, the public, I mean, they've said that they're, gonna, they're behind EMV, they're going to invest into readers in their marketplace. But, and there are, there are um, acquirers that have invested in that capability that are turning it on. But again, it's measured in years. I mean, we're talking a five-year horizon. I know you guys are looking for some sort of, this is you know, my opinion on this, but it's a, it's a reasonable amount of time until when you really see that kind of ubiquitousness more than when you just kind of cross that line. Um, we've, we've got a real amount of time to, to deal with this, and it's about kind of smartly investing for the future. We'll talk to you about EMV and chip and pin. Correct them. The EMV is not necessarily chip and pin. Now, a lot of people try to equate those two together. In our world, in vending machine, to add a, a secure pin pad to a vending machine would be incredibly costly. In addition to the cashless hardware you've already, you already are used to purchasing, you have to purchase yet additional secure pin pad, which costs well over $100. So the fact that the decision has been made that pin is not going to be required on low value transactions is a significant benefit to the industry going forward. At the end of the day, NFC are contactless uh, readers that you already can purchase from M CPI and other companies uh, already have you know, embedded in them the capability to go forward with EMV. You, you just said that the four in one is compliant. The four in one bezels are compliant or something. Can you, can you expand on that? And then I wanna ask a follow up question after you do that. Okay, do you guys wanna? Patrick. Talk about it. Yeah, sure. So, so the f the f MEI four in one bezel, it, it only supports obviously MagStripe transactions and contactless. Um, from an EMV perspective, it has gone through the um, you know card brand certification. So it's gone through. There's as Brian mentioned before. There's th you know sort of three levels of certification. From a hardware perspective, it goes through two levels. They they call it level one and level two. Mm -hmm. The level one aspect of it is really down to the hardware components and to make sure that um, you know all the electromechanical you know, pieces of the bezel are compliant with the EMV standards. Um, that it is. From a level two perspective, how it's certified is it goes through um, various you know, card tests and test scripts that each one of the card brands um, have identified as being required to, to meet the standards. So it goes through a series of you know, Visa test scripts, it goes through a series of MasterCard test scripts, and you know, whatever card brands you wish to certify to. Um, so the foreign one has gone through that with Visa and MasterCard. Um, as Brad mentioned before, that, that level two aspect has to be repeated every several years. 
Um, but we have already met that requirement from the four in one perspective. But to my earlier point, just because it's compliant doesn't necessarily mean it's capable. So, you know, if you if somebody walked up with an EMV contactless card to an existing four in one that's installed in the lobby here, for example, it's not going to process an EMV transaction, likely because the gateway or you know the acquirer, everybody on the back end has probably not enabled that functionality. It, uh, Mark's asking to pass two levels, not three. Correct. So that third level would be where you take the card reader, the telemeter, you take the gateway or the processor, and it, you put it through the whole end-to-end -end type of testing and certification. Um, that's where the third level comes in, and that, to my knowledge, has not been done in the vending space in the U.S. yet. Not Nobody has done an end-to-end -end right. certified solution yet. The, 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 there's a big push for cashless. Mm -hmm. And let's say in the next year I'm, I'm going to buy 500 bezels because that's really where I'm going. What do I buy so I don't have to buy something else in three more years? Brad? Don't oh, look at me. You're the yeah. experts. <laughs> I'm just up I'll here as a marketing booth. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I think it's, it's a personal choice, right? Um, we, so l l let me actually, I'll answer that, but I also want to be really clear about something from that last question. Um, the 4-in-1 card reader has the capability to read EMV cards, as Patrick described. There aren't gateways today that are enabling that, so you haven't gone through that complete certification, but it's there. It doesn't have the encryption, uh, you know, the, the key loaded into it, as you kind of expect in, in how encryption works. That can be done, and it can be updated. Um, it doesn't, though, because it'll read that card type, and it's actually, it actually is a point that's in this white paper here. Um, that doesn't mean that it w in the end it will it will get you a waiver for that liability shift because to ha to be ha receive the waiver or not to have that liability you have to be able to have uh, the contact and the contactless reading capability. But I also just explained much earlier that the risk around fraud liability in vending is minuscule today. It'll likely remain minuscule for a long period of time. So that's not the right decision to make about that. So that leads then to your question. This is your decision to make, and it's your business that you're running. Um, it's a good idea to invest in technology that has the capability to be upgraded to accept that media that someone will have in their pocket going forward. We want to, you know, we compete with the retail stores that are out there. We, we're an unintended retail business. We want to have that technology that enables you to accept what's in the consumer's pocket. If it were me, I probably wouldn't be spending the extra money today buying the reader that has the chip-based card reading technology in it. However, that is, as Patrick referenced earlier, that's the media that, or the, you know, the, the, the type that's being issued in these cards by those issuers. Contactless, that's what's being issued around phones with you know, companies like ISIS and, and NFC capability. You, I don't know what the answer is in terms of where all that will end up and five years from now exactly what card we're going to have in our pocket and how many of us will have that card. and we'll, Will they have, you know, what percent will have contact and what percent will have contactless in both? From David's point, all of them will have MagStripe because actually there's a regulation. You have to be able to fall back to MagStripe as the lowest common denominator because that Visa brand promise is that wherever the Visa logo is, you're going to be able to accept Visa. It doesn't matter, you know, what of the what are those things that are there, right? And so MagStripe is that lowest common denominator. So long-winded way of saying I think it's about picking what's right for you and buying something, if you can, that has those technologies such that you don't have to reinvest in the future, not because of a compliance reason, but because of you want to you be able to accept what your consumers have. And I think, you know, looking at the other geographies where EMV, you know, is today, and just kind of looking at their implementation and migration and, and kind of using that as, as a guide. So Chuck mentioned before the EMV standard was created in, you know, 1994 in Europe. Um, from a vending perspective, putting chip reading terminals on vending machines in Europe is really only something that's picked up over you know, the last four or five years. Um, so that's a big gap, right, where you know, operators there didn't see the need to put it on there or you know, for maybe if there are some other reasons why they chose not to. Um, but looking at Canada as well. So you know, Canada started their chip migration um, at, I mean, what? 2003. 2003 is when they started. Um, they had similar you know, liability shift dates that were put in place. Um, their liability shift dates were in like the 2010, 2011 timeframe. And if you look today in the Canadian market, there's still MagStripe readers on all of the vending machines that are up there today. Um, so, you know, those operators didn't feel that the risk was high enough to go out and actually, you know, 
re, you know, refit all of their machines with chip reading terminals. So I think that's a good example to look at. Um, that you know, just you know, that that October date is not as scary as it sounds. And to Brad's point, the risk in our um, the risk in our industry is not you know, it's not as high as say a Best Buy or or a big box retailer that's selling those high ticket items. I think one thing that I would add to the whole thing is is when you look at all of this, it's all about managing risk, right? As an operator, okay, let's not talk about the security risks or any of those things. But as an operator, what's your risk in the situation, right? And think about how you manage risk in your own life, right? I have car insurance, I have life insurance, I, have, I don't have alien abduction insurance because the likelihood of it happening is very low, right? It is available. It is. It is. You go online. So, I spend a lot of time on computers. So, 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 so that's one thing. So that's the likelihood of something happens. And then it's the cost if it does happen, right? So as Brad was saying before, the cost, the actual, you know, the, the liability from a, a financial perspective to you, it's a very low risk. So if it happens, it happens and it's not very expensive. So do you spend money to prevent having to spend that money on the risk itself to cover the liability, right? Or do you have insurance cover the liability? And this is the kind of thing, you're buying insurance. When you're buying EMV, you're insuring yourself against that capability. How much does the insurance cost is the other question you're gonna ask, right? The, I'm not sure the price of the alien abduction insurance, I think it's reasonable, <laughs> um, but again, it's not gonna happen. The, so what you want to look at it that way. So what's the cost of buying that insurance? The cost of buying a chip reader with all, it's, that's significant at this point, right? The cost of investing in uh, capable technology, not as much. It's, it's not a, a huge jump over where you are right now. So as you're looking at what's available in the market, what you're buying going forward, is it capable in the future of meeting that need as the risk or the requirement goes into place? That's the way I would look at it. And, and I think it's a pretty straightforward. It's, it's all about risk and how you mitigate and manage that risk for your business. Can I ask the, the, the question in a, in a different way? Um, so if, if in my business, I feel as if I want to go the direction of the four in one, which is a contactless reader, and I know that it has the capability of receiving an uh, EMV contactless transaction or possibly an NFC transaction in the future. And I understand the risk liability. The question is, if I invest in the four-in-one bezel, the telemeter, and I go through my gateway, when all these other hooks become available for the gateway and the acquirer to process those transactions, will there be a cost or a significant cost to bring that equipment up to that level? Or is it all over-the-air downloads? Is it all remote key injection? Is there another hardware or license fee or software fee that I'll be paying at that point in time? If I believe the hardware today is what's gonna carry my business forward based on my customer base, based on my risk analysis, et cetera. It's a tough question and it's a tough question because it somewhat depends based off of the total system that you're applying to. Uh, we've been successful in other markets with doing remote updates remote key injections so that your their cost associated with it was the incremental data that was spent to communicate and enable that thing over the air. Um, we've had a lesser experience, but there are some reasons why you would potentially have to go and visit the machine, swap out the hardware and, and have it key injected somewhere else and there might be a fee associated with that, but it's sort of like a repair type. I mean, it's a, it's a small, small ticket kind of fee. It's not that I need to go buy a new, you know, widget to go put into this device. I think the likelihood of that is, is low, but that also somewhat depends on that t entire ecosystem there, right? The hardware provider can only enable the hardware to do so much. The wireless provider can only enable so much. Is, the, you know, is that system all the way back through the acquirer gonna allow you to push that, that key down there to enable that to happen? Like I said, more times than not, we've been successful in doing that. We're doing that right now in Canada. Um, so uh, we're, in, we're in the middle of going through that actually at this very moment. Um, so that's, that's worked there, uh, but I can't guarantee you that that'll work here. Um, but again, that is, you know, it's the order of magnitude of cost. It's that risk kind of analysis there. Um, you know, it, it would stink if you had to go visit machines and, and, you know, do something physically there, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, can you also comment, is there, do you have an idea of how many terminals there are in the United States? Just, just for a, you know, we know there's roughly, you know, million plus vending machines, two million vending machines. How many other terminals are we talking, just from a scale perspective, to have an idea of how many terminals are going to be replaced? 10, 12 minutes. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, 
the, the total number of merchant locations in the United States is the question. Yeah. In vending? Or no, no, just no. Global. Well, well, so globally. Just, I mean, just I, so you can look at the yeah. slice of the pie that we're looking at in terms of right. vending. So, I mean, I, I found a statistic, don't know how accurate it is, but about 12 million in the United States and about 10, 12 percent of those 12 million are already EMV compliant or they're capable. I'm not compliant, capable, right. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say what have we learned in, uh, as we've implemented EMV in other parts of the world? Anything, any lessons learned that you can think of from an operator perspective that would be interesting to share with this group, whether it be Canada Ed or over in Europe? Any surprises that the operators commented on after the fact and said, didn't realize it was going to be this easy, this hard? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, Ed, do you have any? To really go back. Two thousand three was the start of our, our roadmap. Right now we're not finished that roadmap. Two thousand fifteen is the completion of that roadmap. So operators certainly haven't been jittered by it. Uh, Magstripe acceptance is still accepted in Canada, even though we've had EMB cards for several years now. Um, really, I wouldn't think so. Not really a big surprise from an operator perspective, from a development side, on our side. There has been a lot of rules and regulations around vending that we needed to work through. So, you know, you know, receipt required type of things which we need to work with, you know, certain card brands in Canada to get around. But it's just been a development cycle that's been a more of a challenge on our side. And I think that's that so translates to the operator. Uh, it, it, you know, I think we've we've uh, pointed out that there isn't. It, this is a long journey, right? We've run into a few instances where we've been involved with an operator in other locations around the world where they were working to a specific timeline based off of be it a strategy or a commitment that they've made to a card brand or something like that. And these are you know really, really large machine quantities we're talking about here. And that, from a development side, it's a, it's a lot of work. It's a long journey. And it always takes longer than what you think it should take. And it's more painful than what you should think it should take. But that's what we take on. And Thankfully, um, we've got the experience. We've done it multiple times around the world, and you get better at it each time you do it. And only in those instances where you're bumping up against something in a finite timeline, and I don't think that anybody in this room has a reason to have that finite timeline. So then, therefore, I think that from an operator perspective, it'll be minimal. You know, working with that right partner, letting us take on that pain, leveraging that expertise and that capability, that's, you know, that's part of our job is to make sure that you guys then just have the choice to buy the right hardware or that your acquirer has got that capability in the end. And, and that migration becomes you know, pretty painless. Can, uh, can someone talk to the issue of PCI, please? How about the man that's as, 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 so part of, as part <laughs> of the equation. So, I mean, in what respect? I mean, um, I come from markets where EMV is one issue, but EMV and PCI actually is the full picture. So I don't know, David, you might be better at answer the PCI questions than me. So I mean, there are two different standards. Um, PCI is really more around the infrastructure and the way that the, you know, the way that the, the data is used and, and how it's secured from, you know, not only your physical infrastructure, but then the entire uh, transaction, the entire transaction chain, right? Um, EMV is, is different. I mean, they complement each other, but at the same time, EMV is very much more, it, it's, I think of PCI as, it's a some, it's somewhat intangible. I mean, it's hard to kind of see the encryption. It's hard to see the tokenization. It's hard to see some of those security features. But with 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 EMV, it's very much a a tangible um, a tangible piece of security. I mean, you can see the chip on the card. You know, the 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 level of authentication that takes place before the transaction even leaves the device. I mean, you you can that actually takes place there. Um, you know, the physical aspect of putting the card inside of the terminal. You know, I, I see those things as all physical. Um, and that security is real, where sometimes PCI is a little bit harder to, to get your heads around. Um, you know, EMV is more around authenticating and doing a lot of the risk assessment up front. So the card and the terminal interact with each other. Uh, they, you know, talk back and forth before you even go online. So there's, you know, there's some communication taking place between the chip and the card, analyzing risk. It's doing a bunch of assessment to, to validate that the card's even real before it even goes online. Um, and I mean, I think that building on that, that complementary thing, I don't think that I know of, I don't think there's any provider here in the United States, right, where we're not as far down that road that isn't PCI compliant. 
And in fact, there's a bunch of other regulations around that that are different three-letter acronyms that are just for hardware and that are for the total system and it's you know just for the guy, just for the acquirer, and all of those things kind of get wrapped into PCI. And that's just the that's part of the game that you have to be in if you're going to be credible in that acceptance realm. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what role you play in that in that value chain. So they do work together, and it changes as as you migrate down that kind of EMB path. But again, EMB is more about that encryption element and securing the data on the card such that it becomes much harder to fraud that card. Well, I think one other thing, and, and back me up, David, if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong, is is uh, with EMV. What's good, like the big thing about PCI is all about storing, transmitting, uh, or processing card data within your walls. And so you have card data that, if stolen, is usable. Uh, and it's one of the sources of fraud, and that's what happened at Target, right? They got in, got the card data, that card data is usable, and it's horrifying. It, it, and that's why it's gotten, uh, you know, the, the press that it's gotten. With EMV, throughout that entire ecosystem that they talked about, where that, you know, transaction is happening, I don't think there's a usable piece of information for a transaction that can be made from that if someone got it. Yeah. And yeah. that's the big, big source. But, and the other thing about it, that if, I, if I read correctly, um, with PCI, if they're getting to the point where they're saying, you know, hey, if 75% or more of your transactions are EMV, they're going to reduce your PCI recertification requirements and things like that because you don't need to be tested as much. Your risk is significantly lower. Right. Yeah. Thank, thanks for answering that. Um, actually, I was in five minutes uh, coming in, in late, so I uh, apologize if I actually ask a question that's already been answered to. Um, you spoke initially about um, the liability in terms of, I think you quoted 50,000 devices, 50,000 merchants, and that the total maximum liability would be $1,100. Is that, is that actually correct? No. Yeah, so it's across a set of machines during the course of a year in the United States, and the total va dollar value of transactions across those 50,000 machines, about that kind of range, right, so um, was about $1,100 of transactions are made with a fraudulent card that then the acquirer would have had the option to make that merchant liable for. So you got to ask yourself then even, they, that's not mandatory, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to happen. The acquirer clearly for a multi-hundred dollar TV is going to probably want to go, go get that money back. But, you know, for pennies per, per merchant, are, you, are they really going to go after them? That's kind of that, you know, this, it's a data point, but, it's, it, but it, it is in fact a real data point. And I think it, it sets proportionally uh, and appropriately the level of chargeback risk that we're talking about from a vending perspective. It's important that that's yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and it will change over time. I mean, that's the thing. You know, fraud goes to where fraud can happen. Doug's example about online, it, it will change over time, but it has to be orders of magnitude of change for it to, to likely be where it's a real, real factor in your decision process. I find it confusing that the legislation or the regulation is October 2015, but the infrastructure isn't going to be enabled for many years after that, potentially. So what, why is that? Why, what's driving that mismatch? Part of it is investment and billions of cards, I, I understand, but I, I find it interesting to have that mismatch. Well, I mean, there, there's no, just to be clear, there's no regulation or requirement saying that anything has to happen in October of 2015. It's, it's simply, it's that, it's that liability that will, you know, be, it'll be moved down the chain to the, to the part of the, you know, solution that's the least, that's the least, you know, capable. We didn't say that the, the infrastructure wouldn't be available until many years later. Um, you know, the acquirers had a, a date set forth last year where they needed to make sure that their systems were um, capable. And, and to David's point, most, almost all of those U.S. acquirers have met that date last year. Um, what we mentioned was that it, we likely didn't see the proliferation of terminals until likely, you know, years after that, that October 2015 date. And that's just based upon each individual merchant's, you know, how you know much risk that they see, and then what their you know reterminalization plans are. So, um, well, let's it, let's look at a really practical example. Yeah, you get a new credit card from your credit card company, and it's got an expir expiry date on it. They're going to ship you a new card within some period of time, three, five years, or something like that sort of time frame. 
if I got a new card yesterday and it didn't have that chip on it, it's going to be that time frame before I have that chip on my next card. So, I mean, there's, you know, within that whole ecosystem, there's a really practical reason that we all know as to why it, you know, they can shift the liability shift and the ubiquitousness of the, of the technology will not line up directly with each other. And you know somebody at the bank is doing the math of what's the likelihood, what's my risk, what's it going to cost me, yeah. and the $4 that I might have to pay for <laughs> making that card and sending it out to a billion people. You know, it, it's, it's, it's math. It's money yeah. uh, in terms of the you know, risk, liability, reward, all of that. Uh, and that's going to drive what happens. But I think you know, at, by 2015, I think today, if someone had a compliant piece of, uh, of hardware and you used a processor of one of the 98% uh, you know, that are, all the transactions are going through that seem to be compliant, the uh, compliance and certification mechanisms are in place for the applications, you can have a completely certified uh, solution today. The thing is, is that nobody's going in and making that investment or has, or maybe somebody has, I don't know if anybody's doing it in the US, um, but they haven't done it because the, the, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze at this point, is, is one way to put it. It's not, the effort is not worth the reward you're gonna get for it, but on October 2015, if you're Best Buy and you're selling thousands of dollars of equipment with a, a transaction, you're at risk, and I bet you Best Buy will have their stuff in place by the 2015 date. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's how that's, uh, and I use the term with a lot of people. The the target breach changed the rules of the game. I don't exactly know how, but and David referenced it. You know, if you're, it changed the rules for those guys, and that they, you know, before my read was they were kind of lining up to push back and saying, hey, I got to buy a lot of terminals. I've got a lot of locations. I'm not going to invest that quickly. They lost a leg to stand on there, but that's them. I don't know if it really influences us. More in any other way besides that it will help to create a, a that complete more complete ecosystem more quickly, and then it goes back to then you got it. You think about well, when do you want to accept what that consumer has in their pocket? Any more questions? I think the panel thinks we missed in the course of the question and answer. I mean, the one thing I know that Brad mentioned was just you know going through and building an EMV product. Um, did you know does take a little bit of expertise and, and brad mentioned we got a little bit better at it every time we went through it so i mean i think as you you know sort of look into the future and look into you know the space and the card readers etc you know pick the partner that you know you feel has the best experience in that space right um you know i don't the one question up there is who's providing those emv solutions today um, you know, we said before, there's probably nobody that's offering the full solution, but, you know, from a hardware perspective, you know, we have the experience um, so far, and I think we're probably one of the only um, who's had made a significant splash with the, with the technology and the card readers. Um, outside of the U.S., we've already deployed over 20,000 terminals that are processing chip transactions today in various, you know, markets overseas. So, um, you know, we've, we've gone through those certifications a couple of times. We've, you know, learned, you know, had a lot of lessons learned. And, you know, when the timing is right for the U.S., we're definitely going to be, um, you know, someone you could look to, um, you know, for a, definitely a capable product. But also, you know, we have the expertise. And if you have questions about, you know, further questions about EMV and what makes sense for you, I mean, look, look to your, you know, CPI and CMS, uh, you know, partners here to, to help you make those, you know, decisions and help answer any of your questions. I want to thank you all for coming. Hopefully what you're getting out of this is some good facts that you can use to make some informed decisions going forward. So enjoy the show. Have a good, have a good week uh, here in NAMA, and uh, thank you again for coming. <laughs>